Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're kicking off. Blockchain is about vision. There is, it's vision and daring and enterprise. And we would like to bring to you now a speaker that embodies all of those qualities. He is a man who has used his network, his passion, and his vision to bring people together, to bring investors together, to bring them together with entrepreneurs, with people who have deep insights in technology to support and grow the businesses that will transform the future. He has done this over and over and over again successfully. I met him a couple of years ago in Istanbul, and he was already a legend. People were buzzing when they found out he was going to be coming to this event in Istanbul. Uh, you know, one of the little footnotes of his career was that he exited three companies in a week to huge success. I'm not going to tell you how much money he made. You can ask him later in our speaker's corner after he's done speaking. But he has come to share his vision, his passion, and his insight today. He is the founder of True Global Ventures. Ladies and gentlemen, brace yourselves. Here comes Doysan Stoyanovic. Hey. Thank you. All right, man, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's see. I just want to see in the crowd how many of you are coming from corporates, from enterprises. Can you please raise your hands? Not that many. All right. So how many are entrepreneurs? Okay. About 20%. All right. So how many are investors? Okay, that's the vast majority. So that's the topic actually what, what, what I'm trying to uh, tell you about from a visionary point of view as um, Andrew said. What is the future of our investment industry which I think is interesting also for corporates and for entrepreneurs of course. So to start with what I believe in when you start to invest in, in you need to create a strong bonds between the corporates and the investors. So what we have in Hong Kong I think is the best gaming blockchain entrepreneur in town, Yatsu, who is one of my partners, Benjamin Sio, who started to brought a stock exchange as the main investor, Bowilo, who is a superwoman, and then from the corporate side, Corey Thompson from um, Manulife, Peter Williams from Citibank, and Robert Lim from Seabury. That's that bond between corporates and investors, which I think is extremely important to find the right blockchain solution that actually can accelerate and actually go into production quickly. So the world looks, what does the world look like? Here is the problem. The problem is the following, that until today, 80% of all tech unicorns have been in Silicon Valley. Talent is, is Stanford University, capital is Sandhill Road, as you know. And then around that, we have the whole Bay Area, which is with Googles, the PayPal, the Facebooks, and so on. It's been a highly concentrated world, which is about to burst. And it is bursting. And the only way going forward that we, we can continue to do innovation is through a decentralized way. So when we have been looking at blockchain in particular, but actually tech in general, we have found four different reasons why we believe in a decentralized world. Number one, where are the developers? Well, I can tell you they are not in the Bay Area anymore. They are either hired or they are not welcome uh, thanks to the existing administration there. Where is commercialization taking place? Well, that can still happen in a lot of big cities like the Bay Area, like New York, like Shanghai. But where is the regulatory climate there? And we'll talk about more of that in terms of security token later on. But that's maybe Hong Kong, maybe Singapore, maybe Switzerland and Paris. So in many st stages, a lot of new cities coming up. And where is the funding? Maybe Dubai and maybe uh, Hong Kong. So what I'm trying to say is that the world of the future looks very, very different if you want to find the best deal. It's not anymore as concentrated as it was. And my be best testimonial to that is Greg Kidd, who kind of liked me uh, and always said, you are a hardworking Scandinavian and now moved to Southeast Asia. But why would I invest with you when I'm sitting on all the deals for in, in Silicon Valley? When I showed him that page, of all these 30 cities, he said immediately, I'm in. I've already invested in Ljubljana and Tel Aviv for two reasons. I need developers, and I need also with you to diversify, to get more regulatory certainty, to also invest in countries and, and cities where there is more regulatory certainty. Same with Steve Bennett, same with Mick Sullivan. So we created a super team across the world, including Hong Kong, where we invest in four areas which we believe are the future of the blockchain equity system. Uh, blockchain financial services, blockchain infrastructure, blockchain entertainment, and blockchain data analytics. Now, we believe in equity. We will come back to security tokens, which might have a, 
uh, uh, future, but we believe still that equity is the play and how it's going forward. And we believe that equity is just coming into place now when the general crypto uh, hype has burst exactly like the dot-com boom burst. So we believe that in equity investors have the right conditions to actually help the startups. Now, where are we looking at the future? We believe that some industries, and real estate in particular, will change over the years, and has already changed, already. So the property and rent ledgers are already on distributed ledgers, no matter if it's Andhra Pradesh in India, or if it's Sweden, where I'm originally from, or if it's Kenya, the provinces of Australia, or some parts of the US. They are there. The land and property registers are digitalized on the blockchain and are a digital asset. Given that they are digital assets, they can be used for asset-backed lending and get quicker in financing. We can use security tokenization on those um, different assets in a way better way where we can quickly finance uh, the different commercial real estates. We can fractionalize them even what the law firms used to do and the accountants used to do the technology is doing. And last but not least, we can create liquidity between all those investors who invest in these projects. This is very high level, but it's very important because the real estate industry is changing and those who are in real estate should not miss the boat because their bread and butter is changing now. Now, there are a lot of different user cases out there. I mentioned in Chrome Away Methods property to mention three that are very interesting in the land and property register. There are others in terms of financing the, uh, the uh, real estate itself. The most known, as you all know, is the St. Regis Hotel in Aspen, which was basically created from a compliance point of view by Templum and marketed by Indiegogo. $18 million from only qualified investors. On the insurance side, we see that the whole title insurance in the US is moving into blockchain. So if you have a claim on that, on that part of the building, if it's a divorce claim or a fraud claim or whatever kind of litigation claim, it's there on the blockchain. And there are others doing it, Investor Crowd, Harbor, Templum, Rickblock, Slice, and so on. So that's on the real estate. On the private and public markets, and we'll move into the security token step by step, which is the big theme probably for the day. We saw already in 2013 and 14 first experiments when uh, one of my portfolio companies did a joint venture uh, with NAS NASDAQ to see how through the blockchain we could diminish the 60 to 80 days processing times it takes to buy and sell stock on private markets. Today it's reality and it's happening. Token Factory is doing something similar with the London Stock Exchange. Gibraltar Stock Exchange is doing it as well. All those private and public markets, NASDAQ is doing something similar as well. No matter if you're private or public market, it goes step by step into more and more use of uh, of um, a distributed ledger technology, and we will talk about the security tokens in particular later on. Now, one thing, and this is a little bit commercial, this is one of my portfolio companies, but just to tell you that it, it is really happening. So SharesPost actually on January 10th did provide the first security token um, transaction with custody. That's number one. Number two, just actually a week ago, they did also a second, um, uh, created a secondary liquidity, which basically means that a fund, CityBlock, can raise money on shares post, uh, general equity, no tokens involved. They invest into equity, and after one year, they can create liquidity. This, I believe, every single fund will do in 10 years. To create liquidity in early stage funds, uh, like angel funds, VCs, or private equity, has been the most illiquid asset in the world. This is actually maybe not a revolution, but a huge process improvement, which means that going into these very illiquid funds becomes liquid, which means that you open up the whole asset class and you can get more investors who, who actually demand more liquidity than to wait for 10 years, which is the usual case in the VC and private equity environment. Now, Ripple, you've heard about, that's Greg Kidd and Steve Bennett, two of my uh, co-founders of Trugal Ventures 4+. Plus. That is already a story. So people tell me, are there any industry user cases? Yes, they are. They are doing cross-border payments. It's not only Bitcoin that is a user case. There are loads of user cases. They are there in real estate. They are there in private and public markets. They are there in payments for sure. Um, now, the most important user case in the gaming industry is right here in Hong Kong. So the CryptoKitties actually studio is owned by Animoca Brands from Hong Kong. 
So it's a, full, a fantastic team led by Yatsu, uh, who has managed to get a fantastic team around him. He's a second time entrepreneur and has built a traditional gaming company and on top of that now integrated for the last 12 months a lot of different blockchain projects, as you can see on the right hand side. So that is happening in Hong Kong right now and I think everybody from Hong Kong should be very proud that you have one of the most promising companies right here. And the gaming industry is important because in the gaming industry things happen that are, given that they are not as regulated as the financial services industry, you can see things happening there before the financial services industry. So if you are in the financial services industry, check out the gaming industry, see how things work there and try to get inspired how that could work in the financial service industry. Trading and buying virtual goods has been done you know, for a while in, in the gaming industry where it's only hitting the financial services industry now because it's way more regulated. So it's very, very interesting from a strategic point of view to have a look at it. So where do we invest? We can skip that. Uh, what we do, we can skip. What is very important is actually what is happening now in terms of the security token regulations. I, I, when I came to Southeast Asia in 2014, somewhere in 15, 16, we were talking about payments. Do you remember the sandbox payments? Like we had sandboxes everywhere in Southeast Asia. Everybody wanted to make a sandbox for payments because every single country thought it was very important to be on top of payments and payments innovation, right? So there was almost a battle between every single city wanted to make a, a sandbox. Exactly that same story is now happening with security token. It's like you copy paste. Now, maybe some other cities are more at the forefront than in those days, maybe some less. But from a Southeast Asian point of view, it's happening here from a global point of view. So look at that. Hong Kong has done a sandbox that Juan just mentioned end of November that you are probably more familiar than me. Thailand just actually accepted security tokens from a regulatory point of view, I think it was two weeks ago. Philippines has always been the hidden pearl in terms of regulation when you want to test things. Singapore has very clear guidance. What is the utility token? A security token has to follow the security law and the payments directive is in terms of payments tokens. So it's very, very clearly defined in Singapore what you can do. These are just four examples. And like we had with the payments uh, sandboxes, I'm expecting more from Southeast Asia. We have in the United States things moving slowly there as well, but very, very slowly. From Europe, we probably have the best area of regulation in Switzerland. Now, this is important because regulation brings talent. We are taking so much risk as investors and entrepreneurs, so the last thing we want to do is also to happen to end up in jail. So that means that you go to a country where you're allowed to do things. And that means that you have talent coming into those, in those cities and those countries where you're allowed to do this. Now, I don't believe that whole teams and whole companies are going to come neither to Hong Kong nor to Thailand, to the Philippines and Singapore, but bits and pieces of those companies will be here and maybe the most strategic parts as well. So it's a new way of a new decentralized world that we are looking at with, with the security tokens. Now, what are the other trends that I, that I would like to mention? Um, number one, I did talk a little bit about the liquidity in investment funds, no matter if it's angel funds, VC funds, private equity, they're all highly liquid. But it's happening already now. We mentioned blockchain capital, we mentioned city block. So it's already happening. We should mention definitely Spice VC, which is also happening. So, so all these are different degrees of liquidity. Some of them have tokenized funds and want to have liquidity from day one. I personally believe that's too much because you shouldn't invest on a thesis where you haven't even invested the money. Some are more moderate, which allow liquidity of the year one, which would be city block. Everybody can decide in terms of their investment thesis how, when they want to have the liquidity. But the big good news that liquidity is there and it's changing the investment world. Now, what is the other main uh, area of other areas that is happening? We also have Gibraltar Stock Exchange doing something similar in Gibraltar. And as you know, they're pretty big in Hong Kong and Singapore as well. Overstock and T0 is doing something now. Coinlist just mentioned last week that they are doing their first security token offering. We see a lot of more volume in the crypto market in the last 10, 15 days. Something is happening. I would summarize it that there is slightly more regulatory certainty, but I would call it slightly more. I don't, I don't want to call it 
there is a lot of regulatory certainty, but there is slightly more regulatory certainty, and that's what the blockchain world needs. So to summarize, the four things that I believe is the future for any kind of investment fund, no matter if it's the angel fund, if it's a VC fund or a private equity fund, the most and the biggest process improvement is the liquidity piece, and it will be the biggest thing. And I do believe that in 10 years, all funds will have this liquidity piece as a standard element on the smart contract that they can trade between existing LPs and or provide also for other LPs to come in. Number two is that the fundraising, uh, uh, the fundraising processes will be changed. People will go to platforms like Shadesbrook, like Gibraltar Stock Exchange and raise money from those marketplaces as opposed to go across the world in 30 cities and try to meet LPs on a face-to-face -face uh, 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 perspective. Domestic versus international, I think that's a big thing. We used to have companies where you would go from US to UK and they made the rest of Europe. You would go to Singapore and then to Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. You would, from a Swedish point of view, go to maybe UK, France and Germany and then the rest of the world. That kind of internationalization, I think, is not what's going to happen in the future. If you have one blockchain user case on real estate and dematerialize the, the land and property registry in Sweden, you go straight to Sheikh Mohammed in Dubai and do the same thing there because he wants the same thing. The internationalization of our companies, no matter if they're early, middle, late stage, are going to be fundamentally different in the future. This world, no matter what the macro is doing and the politicians are doing, are getting glued and glued together with the strongest technology that no politician can ever destroy and the strongest bridge in the world. And it's called the distributed ledger technology. And that is actually very, very strong because it gets us together and builds those bridges between people in trust, which is extremely important. So that's on the internationalization piece. On the investment decisions, how have we made decisions until now? We've been looking at the entrepreneurs and trying to recognize ourselves. Is that the guy that I used to be when I was an entrepreneur? Hmm, yes, probably, unconsciously, and then I put in money. I didn't recognize myself with you because I'm a man, you're a woman. So that is completely wrong. So that's what we have to break. And the only way to break that is with uh, technology and data analytics, to really profile the best teams on real merits and not on what we unconsciously believe are our egos that we kind of recognize with our eyes. And that I think is extremely important that we can bring in with, with the way more sophisticated data analytics tools. And last but not least, we've been listening. So what I've been summarizing for you, we've been listening to about 170 LPs in family offices to try to understand how they think. And we know two things, that LPs, when it comes to blockchain technology, they want to invest in something they understand. And most of the stuff that we normally talk about, they do not understand a yota. So that's number one. And number two, they do not want to pay any fees. So this it sounds very simple, but you know, we have a disconnect between the blockchain world and the real world. And if we want to bridge that gap, we have to listen to the real world and understand where they are coming from, as opposed to being, believing that we, we are the super smart uh, heroes of, of the next generation and the world. So that's really what we've been doing, and I thank you very much uh, for uh, listening in. I do have time for one question, if there is somebody who has one question. If not, thank you very much. Right, ben, thank you so much. Absolute rock star. You, you sprung it on them at the end of the question. I will let you know that after he gets his microphone off, we are going to be sending our speakers to our speaker's corner. So if people want to come and pigeonhole you outside, I can see they're all packed around the edges here. That'll be the opportunity where they can get into it with you and ask you to get, get into all the secret dirt. So ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Deutsch and Stefan Sojanovic. Thank you. Thank you.